couple new theories about working memory. Uh, two of the major ones are um, the activity silent model of Mark Stokes. And the model I'll be telling you about today is the dynamic attractor model of Michael Lundqvist. And both these um, models say essentially the same thing, that in between spiking, spiking is actually very sparse during working memories. And in between the spiking, there's these changes in synaptic weights so that the spiking actually leaves an impression in, in, in the network that helps carry the memories between these sparse episodes of spiking. Now, it sounds like a very simple, maybe even trivial thing. You have, this, you have the um, weight changes carrying the memories between spiking episodes, but it actually has very profound implications for how working memory works, some of which I'll, I'll, I'll be telling you about. So let me begin with the, I'll tell you a little about the dy dynamic attractor model of Michael Lundquist. This is Michael here. Um, he, when he published his paper in Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, I was aware of it because, well, one thing, because this is what I do for a living. And the other thing is I was the editor at, uh, at, at the journal that accepted it. And uh, about a short while after um, the paper was accepted, Michael wrote me and said, hey, I know you've been studying delay activity for many years now, but I have this model that shows you're all wrong about it. Can I come to your lab and use your data to prove you wrong? Now, I was very charmed by that um, for a whole bunch of reasons, including that um, I really have a healthy distaste for dogma, even dogma I helped create. So I said, sure, come to the laboratory, and he, he's here now. There he is in the back of the room. Um, and let me, let me tell you about his model. So the model is that neurons coding the same stimulus are connected into local clusters. Clusters form assemblies. Just think of assemblies the same thing as an engram, engram of the working memory. Competing clusters share feedback inhibition. All the engrams try to shut each other down. Um, the default network state is beta. If there's no input to the network, the, the network just um, bubbles along in, uh, in, beta, in the beta range, and there's low, low levels of spiking. But then if you activate an assembly, if a bottom-up input activates an assembly, activates an ensemble, it, the, the in input kicks the rhythms up to the gamma range for a sh very short burst. And this, causes, this and this causes more spiking, causes an increase in spike rate. And this changes synaptic weights, thus storing the working members. He so that's the model. And uh, we set out to test this model in pre-existing data from my laboratory. And we used data from an experiment in which the monkey had to, well, here's the detail of behavioral tasks. Don't worry about the details. All the monkey, monkeys are doing in this case is holding either two or three colored squares in working memory over working memory delay. So they make a judgment about them at, at the end of the delay. So the first thing we notice, and by we I mean Michael, first thing we notice is that there seem to be two types of recording sites in the prefrontal cortex where we did these recordings. Two thirds of the sites showed this kind of profile here, where I'm showing here is um, frequency on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, the S1 and S2 are the two squares the monkey had to hold in working memory, and out here is the working memory delay. And the majority of sites, two thirds of them showed an increase in beta power at the beginning of the trial that lasted throughout the trial and then went down to some baseline level after the trial was over. One third of the sites showed, also showed um, increase in beta power during the task, but this, these beta oscillations were temporarily disrupted by bursts of higher frequency gamma during stimulus presentation and also at the end of the delay here, just before the working memories had to be read out of working memory. So what accounts for the differences to these two types of recording sites? When you first look at something like this, you think, well, as an electrophysiologist, there must be some electro simple electrophysiological difference between the sites. There weren't. In fact, we had a similar incidence of is isolatable neurons at both types of these recording sites. So the incidence of neurons was similar. And even the spike rates were nearly identical across these two sites. There was no difference in the spike rate between the, um, the continuous beta sites and what we call the gamma modulated sites. The difference turned, to be, turned out to be that spikes at these sites carry no information about the stimuli being held in working memory. They may be spiking away, but they're not carrying any information about the working memories. Whereas spikes at these sites carried stimulus information. So it wasn't the spiking that separated these two types of sites, these um, non-modulated continuous beta versus the gamma modulated sites. It was the fact that the spiking at these sites carried information about the working memories, about the stimuli the, the monkey had to hold in working memory. So this is, this is consistent with prediction one of the model that gamma oscillations are tied to the neural encoding of information in working memory. So another prediction of the model is that gamma and beta occur in brief narrowband bursts. 
Now, um, you can see this here. We see this continuous beta here and, and more or less continuous uh, beta with a little bit of interruptions and, and, um, and long duration gamma, at least during stimulus presentation. You also see this on the single neuron level. I saw this for 20 years when I studied work working memory. Um, you see continuous spiking. But that is an artifact of averaging across trials. If you look at individual trials in real time, what you see is a very different picture. What you see is short, brief bursts of, of both gamma and beta oscillations. This is a single trial here. Again, frequency on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. S1 and S2 are the stimulus presentations. There's the memory delay. And we see a bunch of these um, short duration, narrow band, gamma bursts, and a couple beta bursts here. And the spiking is doing the same thing. Remember, the spiking is associated with the gamma burst. So even the spiking is, is, is only taking place, or largely taking place, during, during a short, brief gamma burst in a very, very sparse way. Now, this, this model, the model explains this by, by the fact that these gamma bubbles, what we call gamma and beta um, um, brief events, these bubbles separate in time and frequency attractors for the different stimuli. The idea here is that each of these gamma bursts, the gamma bursts are associated with stimulus information in working memory, each of these gamma bursts is a different ensemble being activated for the, for the different stimuli animals holding in working memory. And what this allows, allows you to hold multiple items in working memory without the activation of their ensembles smushing together um, due to simultaneous activation and distorting them. This, the f time and frequency separates out, separates out the activation ensemble so they don't interfere with one another. But the, um, one of the most interesting predictions of the model, and one that's going to be the jumping off point for what I'm going to tell you next, is that beta and gamma underlie different network states. The network uh, under, under questions are either um, in their default state, and I'll get to what I mean by default in a moment. There's really no such thing as a default state in the brain. You're always, it's always working. But, it, but in, in a one state, the network's in beta, and we get activated by a bottom-up input. It's, it goes up to gamma very briefly. <laughs> They can't coexist. Either the network's in beta or it's in gamma. They don't exist at the same time. Now, and this, this, this slide shows this. Here's the actual um, um, gamma in red and beta burst rate in brown over time, over the trial. This is the burst rate here. Get gamma, beta, and you see they're mirror opposites of one another. Whenever gamma goes up, beta goes down, both during stimulus presentation and here during the memory delay, there's a continuous drop of beta and a continuous increase in gamma, especially near the end of the memory delay when, when the monkey has to read the information out of working memory. So we saw this, this sort of push-pull relationship between beta and gamma. What, it, what occurred to us is that this could provide a mechanism for regulating access to working memory. If gamma is associated with the encoding of information in working memory, the maintenance of information in working memory, the read of information in working memory, then you can, you can regulate access to working memory and working memory storage in gamma by turning up and down beta. You turn beta up, gamma will drop. You relax beta, gamma can go back up, and you can encode information in working memory. So this might be a pretty good mechanism by which you actually gain control over working memory storage. So. Um, I mentioned that gamma is linked to the um, bottom-up sensory information held in working memory. What does beta do? In the model, it's a default state, but there's no, as I said, there's no such thing as a default state in the brain. What beta is doing, and we have shown this over a number of um, uh, experiments in the lab, is that beta is associated with top-down information. When we teach the animal something, some knowledge it needs to acquire to, to perform a goal-directed task, whether it's rules or different types of categories. Categories are another sort of really kind of a special type of rule. But whenever we teach the animal bottom-up information, information that's not present to the outside world, the animal has to learn it to solve the task, we look across all different frequency ranges to see where we see this top-down information expressed. And it's always invariably, every time we've looked, in beta. Not in gamma, maybe a little bit of alpha too, lower, lower, uh, um, lower than beta, largely beta, but, but never in gamma. So that's what beta seems to be doing. Beta seems to be carrying the top-down information. So in other words, we think that beta-gamma interactions could provide a means for top-down knowledge in beta to regulate the processing of bottom-up information, um, sensory information in gamma, thereby providing a mechanism for volitional control over working memory. So what we did next um, is we wanted to examine, by we, I mean Andre Bassos and Robin Lunas in, in, in my lab, we wanted to look more closely at these beta and gamma rhythms, see how they actually interact. So we did a series of experiments where we recorded from laminar electrodes. The laminar electrodes allowed us to record, us to record from all of cell layers simultaneously. 
We can identify the middle layer by looking where the stimulus information first reach it, reach, reaches the cortex. And the first thing that um, Andre et al. noticed is that if you look at the spiking activity during the memory delays, most of the spiking activity that's carrying the working memories is happening in the superficial layers of cortex. So here's the uh, superficial layers, deep layers. This is cortical depth on the y-axis, time during the trial on the x-axis, and this is just multi-unit activity shown in color. The bulk of the delay activity is happening in the superficial layers. Now, if we think about this, this makes sense because the superficial layers of cortex are the ascending layers of cortex. They're the feed-forward layers of cortex. They're the layers of cortex that carry bottom-up information from sensory cortex up anteriorly in the brain. So it makes sense that the delay activity, which are, which are carrying bottom-up information about the stibli, the animal's holding a working memory, it makes sense that it should be in the ascending feed-forward layers of cortex. So next we examine the different rhythms, the beta and gamma rhythms. And that's what's shown here. Here's power of the rhythms on the uh, x-axis, layer, cortical layer on the y-axis with, um, with the middle layer there in dotted line. And what we found is that gamma was, was stronger in the superficial layers and beta was stronger in the deep layers. Now again, this makes sense because if gamma is associated with bottom-up information, encoding bottom-up information in working memory and its maintenance, gamma should be in the superficial feed-forward layers of cortex, because that's where bottom-up information is carried. And likewise, if beta is carrying top-down information um, from the front of the brain to the back of the brain, um, they should be in the deep layers, in the feedback layers of cortex, and that's indeed where we, where we see more beta. But next, what they did is we examined the interactions between, the, between these, these two different rhythms. And the first thing I'll show you is just a, a Granger's causality measure of the actual interactions between the beta, beta, and gamma, gamma rhythms. Granger's causality um, just looks at interactions between rhythms of the same type. You can go gamma to gamma and beta to beta. That's what's shown. You can't go cross frequency. I'll show you that data in a moment. But what's shown here is the Granger's causality influence on the y-axis, frequency on the x-axis. In red is the influence from deep layers to superficial layers, and blue is the opposite. And what this shows is that deep layer beta is, heavy, is regulating, pushing around, it's controlling superficial layer beta. All here in this out beta kind of an alpha, alpha range. Um, the influence is one way, beta from, super, from deep to superficial, not the other way around. And gamma isn't really doing much of anything of, of itself. So that makes sense because if, if you want the top-down signal to control, regulate the storage and working memory, you want it to be one way. You want top-down to control bottom-up so you can control what you think about. You don't want bottom-up to control top-down because that's the environment controlling you. But now, what, remember, what I'm suggesting here is that beta and gamma interact with one another. Beta regulates gamma. To show you that, here's a, here's a plot of the, of the power correlations between beta and gamma and between superficial and deep layers. And what it shows is that beta and gamma are negatively correlated. Um, beta is, whenever beta is up, gamma, um, up is, a, is, a, is a power correlation. So up is, red is more power, blue is less power. Whenever beta is up, gamma is down. And whenever gamma is up, beta is down. OK? So in other words, this seems to support this. What I'm suggesting here is what we have is we have beta um, carrying top-down information in deep layers in the feedback layers of cortex, and gamma carrying the bottom-up information in the feed-forward superficial layers, and the beta is controlling the gamma, thereby regulating access to working memory. So that's the idea, but everything I've told you so far is indirect evidence for this. What evidence do we have for that there's actually these, these interact, beta gamma interactions are actually controlling working memory. So to turn to that, turn to another experiment by, that Michael Lundfist con conducted in the laboratory where we looked at some old data where the animal was doing a sequence matching task. Um, the sequence matching task is the animal sees two pictures in a row, then there's a memory delay, then it sees two more pictures. And the animal's job is to release a lever, make a response if the two test pictures at the end of the trial are the same pictures it saw at the beginning of the trial, and they're in the same order. So it has to match a sequence. If they're different pictures or the pictures are out of order, the monkey says no by continuing to hold the lever. Now the advantage of this is, so 99.99% of working memory tasks have, have the animal holding one thing in memory and just making a decision at the end of that delay. So virtually every working memory task has, has a beginning, beginning of the trial and end of the trial. 
The sequence matching task allows us to look at events within the trial where the monkey has to actually match the sequence. So we look at multiple decision points within in the trial. So starting with the simple thing first, beginning of the trial, the monkey has to encode information in working memory. End of the trial, the animal clears information out of working memory. So just to summarize that, uh, I'm not going to show you the data because this is, this is, this is low-hanging fruit here, is that because all working memory tasks have this feature, is that beta goes down at the beginning of the trial, gamma goes up, and spikes start carrying stimulus information, consistent with this idea that relaxing beta turns on gamma, which allows encoding information in working memory. At the end of the trial, the opposite happens. Beta goes down, gamma goes up, and spikes stop carrying stimulus information. So, so far, so good. That, if you want the evidence for this, please read our paper, but that's the easy thing. Let me turn to the, what's unique about this sequence matching task, and that is these decision points here when the animal is judging whether this sequence matches the sequence it saw earlier. So let's take the situation where the first test object is a non-match. What that means is the whole sequence is wrong. Now, the trial's not over yet. The animal has to wait to either respond or not respond until a couple seconds have gone by. So the trial's not over, but the monkey knows that the working memory is no longer relevant. And even though the trial's not over, the monkey can just use this opportunity to just clear out working memory right there. So what happens? So the predictions are is that, um, that if, the, if the first test stimulus is not matched, the monkey can clear out working memory. Beta should go up. And it does. This is now we're looking at this is time on the x-axis, um, um, burst rate, beta burst rate on the y-axis. And this, these two squares here is the first test stimulus here uh, and the second test stimulus. And where the beta is going up is the delay between these two test stimuli. So what happens is beta goes up, as predicted. Next prediction is that gamma goes down. And it does. Here's the gamma burst rate um, registering the bottom-up input of the first test stimulus. First test stimulus is non match um, beta goes up, gamma drops down, and, and uh, the gamma burst rate to the second test stimulus is much more muted because the animal knows that stimulus is no longer relevant. And what happens is then sp the prediction of spikes will stop carrying working memory information. That's exactly what happens. After beta goes up and gamma goes down, the information in the spike rate drops to nearly zero. Okay? So, so far, so good. Now, let's look at the... Um, prediction what happens in a different situation. Now, let's say the first test stimulus is a, is a match. Now the monkey has a different, different sort of operation it needs to do. It's not going to clear out working memory. What it has to do now is switch the contents of working memory from the first stimulus, which it already made a decision on, to now start thinking about the second stimulus in anticipation of matching the second stimulus. So the animal should switch the contents of working memory to the next object. So what happens there? But if the first test stimulus is a match and the monkey has to switch the contents of working memory, the very first thing that happens is there's a short latency, short duration increase in beta. It's kind of like I just showed you, but with a couple crucial differences. The beta increase is happening earlier, and it's, it's, it's much shorter duration. It's dying off before uh, the second test stimulus appears. So you get this burst of beta. We think that burst of beta is clearing the contents of working memory from the first test object. But then the, working, then the beta rate decreases before the second test stimulus, which, which is, isn't like I showed you before. And this should allow gamma to reemerge before the second, second test stimulus. That's exactly what happens now with the beta relaxing. Gamma could reemerge. And this should allow spikes to start, carrying, to start carrying information in anticipation of the second test stimulus. And that's exactly what happens. Okay? So we look at, at we also looked at, er, in this type of trial, the animals can make a whole bunch of different types of errors. The animal could get the objects wrong, could get the order wrong, could make a wrong, wrong judgment about the first test stimulus, second test stimulus. When you look at behavior or spike rate, all you can tell is the animal is, is going to make an error. Things sort of go crazy. They, the spike rates stop. But by looking at these beta gamma interactions, we can actually tell you not only that the animal is going to make a mistake, we can tell you what kind of mistake the animal is making. Is it matching the first test stimulus wrong? Is it getting the order wrong? By looking at beta gamma interactions and not spike rate, we can tell you have greater insight into exactly why the animal is making errors. So let me sum up by presenting you our, uh, our ideas about, about, about working memory. So the idea here is that um, strong deep layer beta carries top-down information. Now, a couple of things to remember about um, um, the deep layers of cortex is the thalamus forms loops with deep layer cortex. And we know the thalamus is important because uh, it's relevant here because the thalamus plays a role in regulating cortical feedback. 
my Colossus lab has shown that if you, if you take out parts of the thalamus, you don't disrupt feed forward flow in the cortex, you disrupt feedback flow. And um, work from uh, um, Sabine Kasser's lab has shown that the, the thalamus may provide beta rhythms to, to the cortex. And this plays a role in regulating top-down feedback when the animal is having, having to switch attention. Um, so strong deep layer beta carries top-down information. This in turn, the deep layer beta, oops, deep layer beta regulates superficial layer beta. Whenever um, beta goes up in deep layers, it goes up in superficial layers. This in turn, superficial layer beta in turn, regulates superficial layer gamma. Whenever beta goes up, gamma goes down and vice versa. And this regulates the spiking and the synaptic weight changes that stores bottom-up information in working memory. So we don't know all the answers, of course, about how you get volitional control of your own thoughts, but this is our idea for a neural mechanism of how the cortex, the mechanism of the cortex, that allows you to gain volitional information over your own thoughts. So I thank you for your attention, and I thank, of course, my laboratory, who, do, who they're the ones who do all the hard work in, in getting these experiments done. Thank you very much. Thank you. I do. Uh, so we have time for questions. Yeah. Wolf. So what's your evidence that gamma is the mode of action where the synaptic plasticity occurs? And which type of synaptic plasticity are you thinking of? The short -term heavy That's a great question. Um, we're not specifying that in our model as of yet, but it, it's going to be a non hebbian mechanism because it lasts a very short period of time. Um, Mark Stokes, um, in his review on his activity silent model, says it's, it could, that calcium dynamics in, in, in synapses could store change synaptic weights for a few seconds, which is in the window of what, what, what we're seeing right here. According to our model, these short-term, these spiking, it could, it could be as simple as like leaving neurotransmitter tra in, 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 the, uh, in the snaps too. But our model, the, Michael's model, suggests that you first induce these changes, and then every once in a while, after a second, half second or a second, yet you need to have a little more spiking to refresh those synaptic weight changes. And that's why we think it's, it's a non hebbian mechanism, because it's not a permanent change, it's a very short-term change. When you say gamma carry information, is it also carrying the code or it's just a channel? It's more of a channel. So this, we, the spikes are carrying the stimulus information and the spikes are associated with, with gamma. So it's, it's more of a channel. And I, I should, should hesitate to point out that, you know, we're not the first ones to point out this. That, well, other labs have pointed out this difference between beta and gamma. Pascal Fries' lab, Pascal's here somewhere. He has, he has pointed out that uh, um, beta and, and Andre Basso, somebody worked in, uh, in, in Pascal's lab, pointed out that gamma is normally is associated with bottom up and beta with top down. Yeah, but we think it's more of a channel than the, the spikes are actually carrying the information. Yeah. I wonder if you could say more about the errors and the specific types of errors that you alluded to at the end. Um, what are the errors that Right, yeah, that's a, um, so imagine a trial where the, the first stimulus comes along and it's, it's a match. But the animal makes a mistake into the trial. Why is the animal, ma why is the animal making a mistake? You could, it could be because the animal is missing, making a mistake about the second test stimulus. Or it could be because the animal just makes a mistake and releases the lever. But we can tell on a trial by trial basis by looking at these beta gamma interactions that, for example, first time it comes along and, it, and it's a uh, match. If there's a sudden increase in beta and a decrease in gamma, that means the animal must have thought that the stimulus was a non-match, and that's exactly then the animal ma makes an error. And we see the opposite if the, if the first stimulus is a non-match, the animal thinks it's a match, the beta-gamma interactions act like they do on correct trials where the stimulus actually was a match. So we can tell what, what type of um, um, error the an animal is making just by looking at how well the beta-gamma interactions match up to what they do on the correct trials. So I know you nicely showed that the beta and gamma were anti-correlated, but do they ever co-occur with each other abnormally and interfere with each other and cause errors? Yeah, um, it's it's... At least in, in the context of these experiments, abnormally is an abnormal brain could be, there could be kind of some, some kind of something that goes wrong, but in terms of the, the normal animals performing this task, it's, 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 it's this push-pull relationship between beta gamma that we see. The model says, um, the positive of the model is that there's two different network states, so they can't coexist. Maybe they coexist in a, in a dysfunctional brain, but for what we see, it's this, it's this push-pull relationship exclusively. I wonder if you could talk more about how you see the thalamus. Like, do you think that it's helping to sustain activity, or it's helping sustain beta specifically, or 
Yeah, that, that's a million dollar question right there. We're now doing recordings in the cortex and, and thalamus simultaneously. One idea is that what the, what the um, thalamus is doing is providing these lower frequency beta oscillations to cortex. And they have these cortical thalamal loops that are largely separate, not, not complete, they're, they're, they're closed loops, but they also can, they interact on, on the cortical level. And the idea is that these low frequencies from the thalamus are providing these low frequency carrier waves of cortex that allows the different um, thalamal cortical loops to synchronize together in, in the higher gamma range or in, in, in the beta range. Um, that's the idea. And how that happens, I mean, that's a great question. Mike Colossus' lab has a theory that, um, that what the thalamus is doing is essentially, it's, it's not actually carrying information. It's, uh, it's, a, it's like an amplifier that amplifies what's going on in cortex. And we think this may happen in this, in this rhythmic way. Uh, uh, thanks, Earl. Sure. Why don't we move on to the last speaker for the moment?